links to social and political action. I mean, remember Watford was one of the few locations for what was within the county, a Soviet in the early 1920s. I mean, Watford was really trucking in the 60s, with Watford Glass especially, but other the port itself, uh, other businesses like food businesses, Watford Co-op, all of these things, and the Blues, the great uh, soccer team, you know, of the 60s, and the great rivalry between Cork Hibs and the Blues. All that was part of the, sort of the anthropology of Sean Dunn, I think. All new housing estates have a real mix of people. And Jules Park was unusual because Jim Nolan, the playwright, came from a, a row near Sean Dunn. Ben Hennessy, the direct, artist director of Red Kettle and general manager, came from there. Lots of people were coming out of these new houses. The city was moving out. It was going from a town to a city. And Johns Park was a focal point, a big local authority, corporation housing estate. And they had teachers in schools were beginning to teach different stuff. There was rock and roll, Radio Luxembourg, American. Uh, there was movies, cinema, uh, tapes. And that, that makes a difference. People were able to see words, see that other people could use them, develop them. And it just tend to blossom. And he blossomed. Growing up in the tightly knit community of St John's Park gave Sean a strong sense of identity which informed much of his early poetry. Where does it have to start and describe, I am, this is where I came from, this is who I am, this is who I think I am, this is who other people think I am and Sean had to deal with all those things. So always, Sean was always conscious that if he lost St John's Park, if he lost his aunts, if he lost his father and his neighbours and his brothers and sisters, he would have lost himself. One day, in September 1960, an ambulance passed by as I and some other boys were on the way home at dinner time. An ambulance was a rare sight indeed. It was off-white, a colour similar to the cream that stood near the mouths of milk bottles. The roof was curved slightly and the engine had a heavy droning sound. We had a chant for ambulances. Someone is dead! Someone is dead. We ran up the road shouting it. It was then I saw that the ambulance had stopped outside my house. The thing you have to remember about Sean is that his mother died when he was four. That was a great wound in his life. And most people, when they try to make their spirits or make their souls, they'll do so by trying to come to terms with the wound. If your path is business, you'll try to become a powerful and effective businessman. If your path is philanthropic work, you'll try to heal the wound through that. You may try to heal the wound as a father or as a mother, or as a sister or brother, by being good at doing that. If your path in life is poetry, it's inevitable that some element of what you do as a poet will be an attempt to heal the wound. Obviously, the early death of his mother created a certain climate in his life, which he then had to live under. Um, I have absolutely no doubt about that. But you could see that in his poetry at the time there was that reflection about his mother and that sense that his, his mother had meant a lot to him, that sense of loss. And he always seemed to carry that and it's, it cups up in his work in different ways, like even his translations of Akhmatova and stuff like that. There was a sense of this female woman, this female person, this female presence that uh, Sean was looking for that sense of, I think, comfort that a mother gives you. My dead love, without permission they came and washed you, soaked away your usual smells, dressed you in foolish brown despite your love for blue. Darkly they coffined you, hammered nails into you, who feared forced things while rooms away I loved you. Caught gestures and photographs, life and remembered voice, to spite the dark intruders with untrammeled song. Sean's interest in poetry began at an early age and while still a teenager he published his first pamphlet of poems, Lady in Stone. And you know when you're published and you win an award and you have a small collection of, you actually begin to believe, hey ma'am I'm a poet, you know, I'm a poet and I know it, I only hope I don't blow it, and that's good, that, that kind of sense. And Sean came in on the back of that and it was very obvious that he was talented, he was brilliant, I mean uh, Sean was very small and thin. I mean, because his name is Odin, people knew him as Dinners. And, uh, and that's kind of sense that he was hungry, you know what I mean? And he used to carry books in a Darrow's, was a supermarket in Waterford, in a Darrow's bag. 
because you wouldn't want people to know that you actually had books in a bag because tough guys would pick on you. And he didn't look, you know, Sean looked like a poet, I suppose, skinny. I, I was always fat, had the wrong corporate look. <laughs> but Sean just looked, he looked like a young, hungry poet. He had fire and he had words. He had words at will. Clearly gifted with language, Sean became the first in his family to attend university. At the age of 17, he left the familiar surroundings of Waterford to begin the next phase of his life in Cork. One of the things Sean was very conscious of, as I was conscious in my own case, was coming from a working class background into what could have been a hostile environment, but in fact wasn't. It was difficult to be a poet, obviously, when you're in university, you're supposed to be studying what you signed on for and getting decent marks. But really, we were almost immediately set against what we were supposed to be doing, I think. You know, we were really only interested in writing poetry. UCC in the early 70s was a very curious place because most people who came in there came in vividly informed by memories of Paris and Berkeley in 68 and 69. Um, you have to remember that this was a time when if you had a denim jacket and a joint in your back pocket, a guitar over your shoulder, you could travel anywhere in the world and get a bed for the night. And it was, you know, Lenin said that the, the revolution equals um, electricity plus the cinema. For us it was electricity plus rock and roll plus the paperback revolution, which everybody has forgotten about. You could go into Easton's and buy Penguin Modern Poets 5, Ginsberg, Corso, Ferlinghetti for 25 pence. So. We found ourselves part of, when I say we, I mean Sean, but also Tom McCarthy, Jerry Murphy, Morris Reardon, Greg O'Donoghue, and slightly older, Rome Myrtle, David, Nick O'Neill, Rosenstock, Peter Denman. But we came into a milieu where we found ourselves very rapidly realising that you could, if you had the, the nerve for it or the gift for it or the feel for it, you could make a life in poetry, not a career, which is what they have now, but a life in poetry. And for us, I think... I think all of my contemporaries would agree. Key influences there were Sean Lucy and John Montague. John Montague, you know, incredibly serious poet uh, of world class, you know. Um, and Sean Lucy, a wonderful teacher poet. But what they really did for us, John Montague and Lucy, is they allowed us to dream of being ourselves. And they allowed us the freedom to think it might be possible to make a life as a poet. They gave us fine examples. They gave us the books and they didn't try to shape us, for which, as the years go by, I am more and more grateful. So the atmosphere, uh, while it was a creative one in terms of being a poet in that, in a sense, almost wasn't a university atmosphere. It certainly wasn't an atmosphere of any kind of um, careful learning or anything like that. It was really the company on the periphery of the university you know, that, that I was aware of. And then maybe that is the kind of society that poets create for each other, a kind of milieu of conversation and pubs. And Long Valley was very hospitable. Uh, it was also convenient. And inevitably, there was going to be some place where everybody would bump into each other, and it just happened to be the Long Valley, probably because of the extraordinary character of Humphrey Moynihan, um, who made everybody welcome, and who was capable of turning around while making a sandwich and say, I was reading the, the Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner again last night. And it's the again that kills you. you know? <laughs> it was again. You know? So, I mean, you're going, to, you're going to find poets drawn to a place where the owner uh, reads the Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner at 2 o'clock in the morning, you know? You begin with an interest, and it, it doesn't matter what it is, but it is important to find somebody who shares that interest so that there is a dialogue. Um, and I think for Sean, the most important connection and relationship was with Tom McCarthy. I lived in the apartment above him, which I got through Sean Dunn, uh, because he, he knew that above stairs, Jan Chap, the Czech pianist, um, had lived. and. Sean said, Jan Chap, met me on the street one day and said, Jan Chap is leaving. Why don't you go into the auctioneers now? Maybe they'll rent you the apartment upstairs. He was thrilled like to have somebody who we knew, like between us, we had a massive library of poetry books and things, and he knew that his library would be complete if I was living upstairs. So, I mean, we would be busy. We would be both writing, myself upstairs and himself down in flat below. And we would sometimes meet on the stairs, like he would be rushing up or rushing down. 
and it was always the real Waterford greeting like well well yourself or well well yourself have you any tea bags the poet is working upstairs I can hear his typewriter clattering between our arguments poems made among shouts and accusations our fierce anger a dust that clogs the bright needle of his work Sean was publishing individual poems in magazines, newspapers and journals before being collected for the first time in Raven Introductions 1 in the early 1980s. In 1985, he published his first full collection, Against the Storm, with the renowned Dolman Press. After UCC, he struggled to find work and drifted from a job in the library to a brief stint teaching before finding his feet in freelance journalism. This eventually led him to become literary editor of the Cork Examiner. I, d I don't think journalism is any danger to a poetic life, to writing poetry. Whereas journalism, you can still be quite yourself as a writer when you're a journalist. You can still frame the argument, if you like, within 500 words or 400 words or whatever you need to do for your article in the newspaper. And I think that mustering of ideas and framing of ideas in fact, is a pre-poetic activity. I think he learned a lot about how to be a writer from working in the examiner. I think the, the frantic activity of the newsroom, the frantic activity of the, all the journalists working together, zipping in and out, that was an important thing for him, you know, because I think he was learning the facility of writing, how to, how to write it almost in an accelerated, urgent manner through speaking to journalists, mm -hmm. through realising that journalists worked to hourly deadlines, you know, whereas a, a poet, of course, could have a deadline of 30 years. In addition to all this work, Sean also found time to compile several highly regarded anthologies. Sean was an anthologist as well, of course, and uh, there, there, there are a number of different ways of describing an anthology. One a friend of ours from UCC days once described an anthology as the perfect instrument for antagonising every living poet you know, because even when, even when you include them, they invariably feel you've included the wrong poem. Um, I think Sean's, the first, the, the Monster Anthology, um, was um, a career move. I think he had decided to make a career as a man of letters, and an anthology is a, a very useful thing to do because it confers an authority on the anthologizer, it makes you a spokesman for a place or for a particular set of people. Um, so I think that was a conscious decision actually to build a relationship with Peter Jay in, in Anvil Press. But that kind of anthologizing impulse, energy and accomplishment of Sean's came from the fact that he was a professional, he was a professional writer. and. Uh, he, he would take on tasks and his notebooks are full of plans and outlines and undertakings and proposals, you know, will I do this, will I do that, and the beginnings of things and, and some of them he finished and uh, the Munster Anthology, the Munster Poets Anthology was the first, uh, then the Cork one, and th these had to do with a place he came from and a place that he came to and adopted and uh, made his own and, and wanted to give something back to, I think. I think the compulsion to anthologize is also a kind of organizational controlling compulsion where you also wish to sort of somehow rearrange the world and its materials to, to, and to present it in this new way, the way you see it. So it's, you know, it's the world edited by Sean Dunn. Sean's own poetry was developing and deepening as the circumstances of his life changed. This led to the publication of The Sheltered Nest in 1992. I, I think there were two, po two kinds of poetry in Sean's life. Um, his early poetry was very socially conscious, as you'd expect. I think he was very influenced by Douglas Dunn's Terry Street, for instance. And he wrote directly out of his own background and he celebrated the lives of the ordinary. It was almost a programmatic celebration the lives of ordinary people. Um, when he stopped drinking, which was a watershed in his life, um, and when he found himself in a situation where he had a family to provide for and went to work in the examiner, um, I think the, the shock of the encounter with himself and the, the heroic struggle to stop drinking, it often prompts certain kinds of self-reflection, and I think it drove Sean inward. 
And the result of that is in all the later poems, which are much more spiritually concerned. And poetry is a muscle. As, as, as Paul Gallagher says, it's a muscle that needs constant exercise. And, you know, it's like swimming. You can read all the books you like about swimming, but you're certainly not going to learn to swim until you really subject yourself to water. And poetry is exactly the same. You can have any, as many discussions as you like about making poetry within workshops or lectures or whatever. But there is nothing in the, all of those things compared to what you learn about the making of poetry when you attempt to write a poem. And so Sean was continuously writing, I think, continuously attempting to, to f make that muscle stronger, finer, leaner, meaner. I think there's a lyric grace to Sean's poems. There's a delicacy, the kind of thing that he admired, he replicated in his own work. Everything was reduced to words. The noise of feet in wards at night became syllables of prayer, or a sound soft as slippers on carpet. The quiet displacement of kindling by fire. Silence was a vowel, a frozen cloth on briars stiff as a dead woman's face, or a lost language. The stillness in villages on islands he'd sailed to, keen as Columbus. Death came like a mother calling early to the school gates. Warm coat in hand to ease his cold fever. Her voice a balm, her face calm as a countrywoman met at a well. Until she came he begged her for breath. Words broke like birds flushed out from the fields. People were making poems then, as they're making poems now, because something inside wants to speak. It's useful to think of it that way without getting hung up on what that something might be. There is an urge to speak, an urge to dance, an urge to celebrate, an urge to keen and lament. And it comes through us, through the species-wide, it's non-culture specific, it is at all times, in all places, an ungainsable urge. Uh, it gets difficult when we start making marks in this binary code of black marks on a white page and then people who are desperate to make a living as we all are decide that there's a living to be made from talking about this and you know that's where a kind of a disjunction tends to happen there are good academics and bad academics good academics go to poetry readings bad academics think that if they went to a poetry reading it might influence what they think about poetry so they prefer to look at it and what they think of as the pseudo-scientific detachment of the study and unfortunately a great deal of the damage that's been done to poetry in our times it's been appropriated as specialized subject matter by people who don't dance and don't sing and are suspicious of people who do dance and sing um, i'm going this and i'm being sli slightly tongue-in-cheek about it but certainly sean i know felt that very strongly he had a profound distrust of the taxonomic nature of critical discourse it felt that it was not discourse which intended to join with the speaking voice, but rather to criticise it and dissect it. And it really is, if you're a butterfly trying to fly, the entomologist's scalpel is of absolutely no use whatsoever to you. <laughs> and Sean was always trying to fly. One of Sean's most enduring themes was that of silence and the importance of it in the everyday. As part of his search for an ever deeper silence, Sean spent time in many sacred places. A favourite amongst these was the Cistercian Monastery of Mount Mellory in County Waterford. Because everything I write comes out of the silence that I experience, well, either in, in particular places or simply the silence of, um, that we all experience as human beings. And if that silence is not very deep, then, there's not, then there isn't very much to write about. Well, I think silence is the best condition out of which poetry can be made, definitely. Um, I think there's no, there, there can't be a poetry without a sort of uh, a hinterland of silence around it. The silence that climbs these mountains with me, lightening my luggage. My place of hills and silence, violence in faraway squares, disruption shuffling the maps. Flies skitter on the lake's skin, that stillness my strength, the waterfalls gathering roar. Michael Longley was asked once where poetry comes from and his answer was quite fast. He said, if I knew that, I'd go and live there. Nobody knows where poems come from. 
And I mean, we used to talk about this when we were boy poets, baby poets together, you know, when you'd set out to write a poem. And after a while, it dawned on you that that's not where poems come from. That's where verse comes from. So you learn to shut up and wait for the poem. But when the poem is finished, when the composition is done, there is a kind of peace at the end of it, which is a kind of silence. More spectator, voyeur, I kneel in doubt before the altar. A tabernacle shaped like a honeycomb gleams under sodium light. The air is cold as Christ on a crucifix, his silver legs bent and thin to my touch, brown as nuts, beads dangle from fingers. Here I am learning the meaning of love, your absence of contact, some never know. Gentle as drizzle you move in my memory, your brush daubing a canvas for the true image you intuit at the heart of paint. I sense that image in the silence now. I think Sean, at the end, was someone who felt lucky. He got a second chance, as it were. Um, I mean, those pains in his life, the, the, the horrible personal things, the, the ending of a marriage, his um, intemperance, for want of another word, and, and the years of that, um, and the whole kind of repair and recovery from those things and the discovery of a new happiness. I think these just made him feel lucky. And uh, part of that paralleled the, the drive, the need for some kind of um, faith to lean against. I didn't lose the search for God or the search for, the search for a shape for the spiritual feeling that I had inside in me all the time, which never ever went away. It was um, the search for, not so much for transcendence, because that makes us, um, that sounds too dramatic. I, I think it's much more ordinary than that. The search for something that explains the feeling I had that religion didn't explain things in a proper way for me, but the lack of religion didn't explain things either for me. And so, I always had this, this quest, I think there's a phrase, a, a beautiful phrase in one of W.B. Yeats's poems where he talks to a, a woman and he says, but one man loved the pilgrim soul in you. And the pilgrim soul is a beautiful phrase that I think the idea of, of, of pilgrimage isn't just to do with places, it can be just to do with your life as well. Sean's journey in this world came to a sudden and abrupt end when a heart attack took him on August 3rd, 1995. I forget who rang me to tell me Sean had died. And my immediate response was, he should have died hereafter. You know, we had things to say, there were things to be sorted out. It was as if a generation had no preparation for this. We were in our 30s and we were immortal, you know. We were still thinking we were immortal. That's what you do. Um, and then, like that, Sean's no more. And then the funeral service in the Lock Church. And so many people from so many different worlds that he touched. So I think everybody in Cork was stunned. Um, no, I mean, it just was unbelievable. I mean, it was a tearful weekend and week um, for everybody, I think. It was appropriate that he was buried in, in the Valhalla with Oriada and Oriardon, you know, with both the music and the poetry, the very heart within the Keol counter of Munster, you know. And I remember going to Balavorny, uh, to Tober Govnathan, to the cemetery, and the, um, the sense that, you know, well, that's one of us down. The sense that someone had fallen. And I remember thinking it was all right. The birds were singing. He was in a good place. And whatever his spirit had to deal with, it was a long way from there anyway. And I liked the refusal of sentimentality at his funeral. It was just grief.
to all of that. And then the poems were still there. And in the end, cold-bloodedly for any working artist, I think the work is what matters. You know, because nothing else will be remembered. Versions of the life will be remembered for a while, but in a hundred years' time, two hundred years' time, if a poem endures, in some strange sense, it will have been worthwhile. And yeah, I think Sean made poems that should endure. A car door blocks a gap in a field. Through its glassless window, I watch the grass where a black goat stands to look at the wind only goats can see. The door frames an inner world. Rust flecks its handle, the gleam gone from it. Easy at last. I measure fields in light that falls with forgiveness everywhere.